Nigeria's political power dynamics is still at its infancy compared to other countries that have practiced democracy for decades across the world. But since the introduction of the executive presidency in 1979, with the military top brass supporting the emergence of Sheo Shagairi as the first to occupy that position, since then, imagine as the president of Nigeria has never been an easy task for those outside the network of key power brokers who have often nominated people to the presidency. For decades, serving and retired military generals have had to work with their civilian sympathizers to railroad citizens into voting for their preferred candidates, beginning with former President Sheo Shagari in 1979, Olusegun Obasanjo in 1999, Omaru Musayara Adua in 2007, Togulok Jonathan in 2010, and Muhammad Buhari in 2015. But in 2023, the game changed. Bola Tinobu fought his way to the presidency amid a battle by old power brokers to stop his emergence as Nigeria's 16th head of state. Clinching the presidential ticket of Nigeria's governing party, the All Progressive Congress or APC party, a year earlier did not come easy. Then President Muhammadu Buhari had been indifferent towards Tinobu's ambition amid talks of a huge pressure on him by his former military constituency not to support the former Lagos governor. But Tinobu also claims to have been the influential force behind Buhari winning his first term in 2015 after losing the presidential election several times before then. What I will say is that he was lucky that the person he supported to become president at the dying minute decided to repay him after he had already shown the disdain. He had shown interest in contesting and Buhari was not supporting him. He was doing everything against uh, uh, Tinubu and he had the support of very key members of his party you know, the governors like the Erufai and the rest, they were supporting him. And I think they were supporting him in the spirit of reciprocacy. You have done it for us, now we will do it for you. You know, I think the, on the whole, perhaps uh, the contention at that time was that who was the greater contributor to Buhari's emergence, you know, Amechi felt, he, apart from being the DG, he had also contributed immensely in terms of financial contribution to Buhari's uh, emergence. So he ought to have been supported as a southern candidate. Upon clinching the ticket, Tinubu faced a barrage of roadblocks ahead of election day, with some Buhari presidency insiders and old northern power blocks said to have been pitching Atiku Abubakar of the major opposition People's Democratic Party against the governing party's candidates. Then came the Labour Party's Peter Obi, who was being openly backed by the likes of former President Lushegun Obasanjo and his closest former military allies to challenge Tinubu. In a widely circulated letter, Obasanjo encouraged Nigerians to vote for Peter Obi, and it was also an interesting political mix, seeing Ayo Adebanjo, one of two leaders of Afeniferi, the apex Yoruba social cultural group firmly opposing his kinsman and urging Nigerians to back Obi and not Tinobu's candidacy. Obasanjo didn't hide that he was supporting Peter Obi. You know, it was very glaring and very clear. Uh, IBB, you know, as usual, you know, in his Maradonic style, you know, gave all of them blessing as a statesman. But he didn't come out publicly to say this. And the role of uh, Abdul Salam is so critical and so crucial that he cannot lay any support to anybody, being the chairman of the peace committee. For over a decade, Bola Tinobu's presidential ambition had been the worst kept secret in Nigerian politics. Though his name was appearing on the ballot for the first time in Nigeria's presidential ballot, but Tinubu had been gunning for the country's highest political office since he completed his two terms as governor of Lagos State in 2007. Uh, I remember Ola Tinubu designed, you know, um, since he was governor of uh, Lagos State, 
and it was uh, strategic in the sense that he actually had a focus, he had, um, um, you know, uh, a plan, he had a target, which is the presidency. And he clearly understood, you know, what is required. And he went for it. He went, he built, um, you know, his empire over uh, a long uh, period of time. And it was in that context that uh, the Emilocon, you know, um, uh, thing came up. So uh, he was strategic. He knew what he, want, he needed to do. He knew the, uh, the uh, obstacles before him and how to overcome them. Um, uh, for example, uh, the, the power blocks in the, in the country, um, not, essentially not the influential, you know, um, godfathers, the power blocks, you know, the traditional institution, the governors, you know, as well, even the legislature. He penetrated all this, and over the years he built his uh, empire. He built his time properly. Uh, he, he actually sponsored quite a few presidential uh, candidates, you know, uh, though they didn't win, but they, they were building his, uh, his uh, platform towards the, the, the big prize. And uh, eventually uh, he got it, so it wasn't surprising. But and despite all odds, Tinubu would go ahead to win the polls and emerge Nigeria's 16th head of state and 6th executive president. Amid a highly tense and controversial election, the results were announced with him winning narrowly. <laughs> The case then moved to the courts amid a highly controversial judicial process, which eventually culminated in his being stamped by Nigeria's highest court, the Supreme Court, as the president of Nigeria. So how do political analysts view his ascension to the Nigerian presidency, despite not being backed by the traditional power brokers? Close family members. So nobody imposes anybody on Nigeria. They have their own views, they have a right to their views. Well, because the talk has been that since um, 1960, I mean, most presidents have been handpicked. Mm. But Tinobu actually uh, bulldozed. Who handpicked Buhari? Power. Uh, but it's funny, it's difficult to govern. Who handpicked Buhari? Who? <laughs> well, <laughs> a section of the military actually no. supported him. No. Proceed. If there's anything else, the only president that I knew the earliest didn't support was Buhari. We had to leapfrog over the, and above the heads of the elites to the masses to get Buhari into government. That is the truth. So, it's, you know, there's nothing... Well, you can have uh, somebody like uh, Obasanjo has a very... is very active politically and uh, he has strong opinions, but, I mean, for a man who was one of the best presidents... I still think Obasanjo was the best president Nigeria ever had. I still believe so. And... Uh, for, Naturally, he will have an idea of, he will be passionate about who governs. Because they, these soldiers are really patriot, more patriotic than us, having risked their lives at one time or the other for this country. They have higher stake in trying to see that things work. But that is not to say they... But do you hold the same view that people say that Tenobo bulldoze himself to power through money, using money? Oh, if nobody says it, I will say it. If nobody has ever said it, I will say it. It's money. He bought it. Ebola worked on the uh, value of greed in the human mind, in the human being. I don't know about uh, power brokers, because that's one thing that we do in this country that is taking us down the road every year. Now, power brokers or not, they only have one vote. And with due respect to the names you mentioned, they don't carry any weight anymore. If a government wants to do the right things, first of all, think about God, whatever you're doing. Second of all, think about the people. Now, does IBB and the, and the rest, do they care about people? No, it's about themselves. Because bottom line is when they now get, when the person that they back gets elected, they want to claim the credit and appoint their people to become whoever, which is wrong. I'm sorry to keep saying this, Nigerians are suffering. Tinubu has gone ahead to stabilize his presidency by focusing on governance challenges, despite that his key contenders, that's PDP's Atiku Abubakar and LP's Peter Obi, 
have continued to challenge his presidency through constant criticism of government policies under the APC-led federal government. One of the very few politicians in Nigeria that had a vision, drove that vision, and realized the vision. So whatever he's doing now couldn't have been on impulse. They are products of uh, well put together thought and researches. I think the first thing you will see, you will observe in the, in the Tinubu administration is the tendency to be conciliatory. Um, we, we can start talking even from the latest uh, cyber security levy, you know, uh, to engagement with ASO and so on and so on, uh, with uh, the, uh, ex, uh, what do you call it, the expatriate levy, you know. For every issue that comes into the public space and critics had raised issues, it provided a period of cooling down by suspending, you know, uh, that policy for purpose of engagement. Blowing in droves while other people are just watching. So I don't understand this type of government. I, before I didn't, I never associated him with a, a tribalist or a sectionalist. I never associated him with this. But since he came into government, I find it very difficult to say he's not one. If you talk about election, talking to me on the election, don't ever use the word one. He didn't win it, he rigged it. I'll repeat it until I die. With the neck, with knife on my neck, I'll say he didn't win. He knows he didn't win. I used to say this, if there's something in this room and we go out and we find that it is missing, the man who stole it knows he's the one that stole it. We might not know, we'll be accusing each other, but you know. So they know what they did. I mean, they, they're humans. They know what they did, they know how they did it. The only charitable thing I can say is that they're in government. But as to how they got there, uh, we will never agree. I mean, they know it. We agree, they know it. And I, they know I know it. What the president has done is to look at the environment historically, the economic environment historically, and determine this is how we need to move away from what we have been going through. What had been the characterization, the major characterization of the Nigerian economy is a boom and bust uh, character. We are, when we have increase in the price of crude oil and the quantity is also high, we have so much revenue to do, to deal with. And then we go into a frenzy of spending. In the middle of that frenzy, price falls. <laughs> and as Tinubu marks his one year in government as Nigeria's 16th head of state, there have been different views about his style of governance and approach to managing the nation's diversity, with some opposition leaders accusing him of weakening the opposition and planning a one-party state. He came in under a very contentious political cycle where you know, the litigations were all over. Uh, so, and uh, he promised to set up his cabinet, you know, and hit the ground running. But again, that was also delayed, perhaps by the political uh, uh, turmoil in the land. So assessing him within the first year will be very difficult uh, in the sense that if you look at the whole indices that you will use to judge his performance, uh, you discover that you know, there are so many areas you know, that you can continuously look at and you, know, you may not be able to judge correctly. But if you ask me my opinion, I will say that his first one year has not been very impressive. Unfulfilled promises. It has been a year of uh, um, you know, failed expectations. Um, and I think it's uh, generally been a year of hardship for Nigerians. Okay, that, that is a fact. Uh, the figures are, uh, are there. I was just looking at you, uh, watching your uh, news, and it says 33.69% inflation. Also controversial is his decision to appoint 48 ministers, making it the largest cabinet in Nigeria's history. But many of them have been accused by Nigerians of being invisible and non-effective. The poor masses, the 
everything is only designed to elevate the, the rich. That's all. No plan for the poor. Thank you. To crash uh, a petrol. You understand? Bring it down so that those uh, that are uh, importing or exporting goods won't be complaining of a uh, high cost of uh, transportation. It's even worse than Buhari's uh, administration. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> With the rate of things going high every day, it's causing astronomically, I'm talking of, uh, you know, produce in the market. You know, it can tell you, that alone will tell you that the leadership of uh, 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 the lawyer has truly, truly, truly yeah. failed, yeah. if you want the truth, yeah. okay? Um, he has failed in so many aspects. When I try to ask, I've asked several people, what has the federal government done for the citizen of Nigeria? Is it the light, water? In comparison to some other civilized society where you get a food stamp if you are jobless, where you get uh, some stipend here and there, uh, where you get grant for your education and stuff like that. None of these we are receiving from the federal government. I'm sorry, I cannot point out. That's me, Sonny Sylvester Monetafe, a major stakeholder in the APC. And I will never leave the APC. I have not done anti-party, I will not do anti-party. Mr. President, I'm an ordinary Nigerian. I cannot point at A, B, C, D that you've achieved in, on, on, the, on the go. It will be dubious for anybody to talk about nail and armor uh, projects as achievements. <laughs> because even if you are going to build a bungalow as an individual, you know what time it will take to build the bungalow, except you are not serious. It is the direction of the government that is important to me. We are seeing a government that is introducing a credit system into the, into the economy. We are seeing a government that is saying no Nigerian that is qualified to go to school and has been admitted to school would be, uh, would be bereft of that, uh, of that uh, opportunity. So the student loan fund, you know. Um, there are, there are, there are uh, 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 what do you call it, funding for nano, uh, 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 nano ent entrepreneurs, 50 billion that had just been shared, yeah, I mean, that had been shared now, 75 billion to, to companies and all that. There is the Lagos Calabar Coastal Road, exciting. There is the very, which I call very, very ambitious, Badagri Sokoto Road, you know. These, these are in the pipeline. They, you know, we, we, they have even left the pipeline. They are now budgeted, budgeted and budgeted approved projects. The renewed hope cities. Ah, that, that's, these, these are very, very ambitious uh, projects. But we don't expect these projects to have been delivered now. It would have even been dangerous to claim credit for it. <laughs> you know? But again, by this time next year, we can now say, okay, this is how far we have gone. You know, we know that we should be if in, in a, uh, a construction site of a projected 500 kilometers, for instance, in a year minimum, we should have done 120. <laughs> that is when we can start laying credits. But for now, it is the direction, it is the vision, it is the philosophy. Those are what are exciting people like us. You know, it won't be about the exact, the exact, because we know eventually the exact will come because the premise, you know, have been established. I also give uh, even those who are lagging the benefit of doubt. Uh, nine months are not enough, you know, to determine uh, what somebody had, uh, had, uh, I mean, had done in office. For instance, our procurement uh, process is a minimum of six months. So the person gets into office, he needs to do procurement. He will need to first consolidate, consolidate his own presence in that office, understand the dynamics of the office and all that before he even proceeds on, pro, on procurement. And after six months, that is when you start seeing even the processes being crystallized. It will not take another, uh, less than another 12 months before you start seeing the real you know, impact or result of the procurement. So I, 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 I think the, the important thing is to see the philosophy emerging the philosophy that underpins the direction of the administration. 
His first task would be to buy into the confidence of the people. I, for example, would not mind if uh, I would not be dwelling on whether he won or not, if things are moving. Go, after all, go, what was the Nigerians live well, live uh, prosperity, economics, security, stability, you know, ability to live well, uh, good health, health services, all those things, good schools, all those things. If we are having it, who will complain? That's the end, the, the end of uh, government. But we are not getting that. So since we are not getting that, all we are getting is suffering of us, suffering of us, in a very cruel manner. I mean, it's cruelty at the highest level in government. This cabinet is made up of a conquer mixture of strange bedfellows. Those who have no belief in the APC ideology or in the presidency of Tinubu, and there are many in number. So far, some of them can barely be seen. We can barely see anything they are doing. Others are taking actions that put the government on the reverse gear. He should be courageous enough, as he has demonstrated in the removal of oil subsidy, in the student loan scheme, in the, the uh, 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 unbundling of uh, uh, some of these agencies that are modeled up. That courage should also be demonstrated by taking out those who have become the Jonas in this ship of Nigeria. Okay, then, then, then the last year before uh, President Tinubu uh, uh, came to power. Okay, there has been that. And then again also, you might look at it, look at the last one year on the positive side, because one thing with this government is that, uh, to be honest, the last one year has been a failure. There is no doubt about that. However, they seem to be concerned about their own failure. It's different from, the last, uh, from their predecessors, who were failing and they were not concerned about their failure. They are unapologetic about their failure. Uh, uh, President Tinubu won 37%, uh, uh, if I may use that word, just 37% of the votes. So if the opposition had been, you know, uh, united, if the PDP has not been, you know, dismantled into Labour Party, okay, and PDP. One constant criticism by his opponents has been the claim that Tinubu bought his way to the presidency with the support of other money bags. They add that he in turn used it to allegedly compensate cronies, which is now bugging his government. That's what happened. You can't find one of the leaders, so-called leaders, who will walk in and say, do this, don't do this, you this. They collected his money and uh, rigged him in and wrote the result and kept quiet while people were protesting. So who can complain, except those of us that didn't collect his money? All right, uh, so try to round up this conversation. What are the landmark achievements of President Tinubu in one year that I could say positively, I mean, that have impacted my life? <laughs> what do you say, Paul? You say landmark. Landmark achievement can be zero or negative or positive. I, I, what, what can I say now? I don't know of any. Maybe in the future. Maybe the misery he's heaping on us, maybe to start to turn around in the few years. But right now, it's misery over misery over misery. So if you say he paid his way, you know, and on the day of the election, there was no Naira to spend, how could he have paid his way to, 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 to win the election? This has heightened the contentious calls for accountability on the source of his stupendous wealth and similar calls for an evaluation of his personal credentials with the authenticity of his school certificate creating a huge political drama. But analysts say for every Nigerian who insists that Tinubu's world is ill-gotten, there is another one who counters that he merely typifies a political class that is rotten to the bone. I know the president's long, even as a politician, but more importantly as a, what we call a revolutionary, you know, uh, true to the Nadeko days. Uh, had been active and had been a collaborator of the civil society and human, uh, human rights movement. So to a large extent, that is what is made for. That is record. Now, if opposition have so mismanaged their own goodwill and their own structure, and they are becoming constricted too, it's lazy, you know, it is lazy, it is cheap to start now you know, holding somebody on the other side responsible for what, uh, for what they are going through. But those of us who have come encountered with this enigma called President Tinubu today, we met him as 
uh, a political activist in the SDP. Uh, then it was People's Front, PF, who were undergraduates at the time. And uh, he came under the wings of Abiola, who was more or less like her own uh, uh, idea of what governance should be long before he ever contested the elections. I'm tracking this to show that he was not an accidental leader. He is a product of leadership succession, a programmatic developmental leadership succession plan, which he has instituted in Lagos, which people are calling Godfatherism. It is distinct from Godfatherism. What is done from, in Lagos is leadership succession, in which there is programmatic developmental governance. Some analysts say President Tinubu's emergence outside of the old military power brokers and party apparatchiks may be an indication of Nigeria's future political power play, where rich and powerful Nigerians could go the whole hog alone to the presidency. Somna Sambu, Arise News.